thank you for downloading Michael Sandel, the public philosopher. In this third debate recorded at the London School of Economics, political philosopher Professor Michael Sandel asks, should we bribe people to be healthy? Hello and welcome to the LSE. My name is Michael Sandel and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the third in our series of debates. The debates involve public controversies, and it's an experiment in civic discourse and civic argument. My hunch, and that's what we're going to try out in this debate, is this, that our public discourse would go better if when we debate and when we disagree, we articulated more fully the principles, the reasons, the big ideas of philosophy that lie just beneath the surface of the arguments we have. Uh, It seems to me that public philosophy is a matter of thinking and reasoning together, even about hard and fraught and contested moral questions that arise in public life. Today we take up a question that has generated a lot of controversy. It has to do with the use of financial incentives. The question of whether we should pay people to change unhealthy habits. It's estimated that half of UK health spending goes on treating the consequences of unhealthy behavior, excessive eating, smoking, drinking, and lack of exercise. But only half of 1% of NHS spending goes on promoting healthy behavior. And so the logic of paying people to undertake healthy behavior is that spending small amounts of money now could encourage people to live healthier lives and also to save the NHS much bigger sums in the future. That's the argument in favor, but not everyone agrees. Some people say that bribing people to look after their own health is patronizing to them and unfair to those who don't take up unhealthy behavior in the first place. So our question this week is, should we bribe people to be healthy? Let's begin by seeing what our audience here at the LSE thinks about this question. And let's take a particular example of a health bribe, paying people to lose weight. In Kent, there was a trial sponsored by the NHS to pay people, people who were overweight, to lose pounds and to lose weight. It was possible to earn, if you really needed to lose a lot of weight and succeeded in doing so, possible to earn up to 425 pounds if you could do it. Now, let's see what the audience here thinks about the idea of paying people to lose weight. How many people are in favor of a scheme like that? Raise your hand. And how many are against? For the listeners at home, I will tell you that the results of our vote, our informal vote by raising of hands, the majority here in the LSE, are against. Let's begin our discussion by hearing first from someone who's against the scheme. What's wrong with it? Yes. My name's Soraya. I don't believe we should bribe people to be healthy. I think we all have a personal responsibility to be healthy. I think if you are of sound mind and body and you're an adult, I believe that you're responsible for what you put into your body and how you live your lifestyle. I think it's absolutely ludicrous to bribe people to be healthy. Ludicrous to bribe people to be healthy. (laughs) Who else? I disagree with the, um, the, the, the view. I think you can pay people to be healthy. I mean, if we take one example, cigarette smoking. The government take in a lot of taxation from smokers. So on the one hand, they take money in. Why can't a proportion of that money be given back to smokers as a way of stopping the smoking? We want ultimately the lowest cost, and it might well be cheaper to pay someone to stop smoking than allow them to get a serious disease, potentially cancer, where the costs of treating that cancer is substantially more than giving a few hundred quid to say, if you stop smoking, we'll give you £300. could be a lot, lot less than spending thousands upon thousands. So I think that you can and pay people to be healthy. And tell us your name. Michael. So it might be cost-effective. 
Yes, I think it could be. I can think it could be very, very cost-effective. Who else? Yes. I suppose my problem with it is the fact that the government would have to presuppose some conception of what it is that's good, i.e., being healthy. And if you allow the government to start paying people to be healthy, then where do you draw the line? in terms of what else they're allowed to pay people to start trying to create some sort of behavioural response that they desire. And tell us your name. Mona. Mona. What might be some other things that the government might pay people to do that would worry you? I haven't got an example off the top of my head, but, I mean, say they think that children should be reared in a particular way or people should be educated in a certain way. If they start paying people to do things in the way that they desire, then how much choice do we really have? I know you have the choice to decide whether to take the payment up or not, but there is always going to be some threshold at which financial incentives will prevail, and I think that that's a slippery slope towards a a more sort of authoritarian state. A slippery slope to a more authoritarian state? Yeah. Paying people for behavior that the government thinks is good. (laughs) Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, Mona worries that this is a slippery slope to authoritarianism. It involves the government taking a view about what is for the good of its citizens and using financial incentives, or bribes, if you want to call them that, to promote that view. Mona worries about that. Who has a reply to that objection? Yes. Peter West. The government has been incentivizing people to behave in a particular way for years and years. The tax on cigarettes is one way that it incentivizes people to live a healthy lifestyle, and nobody's really objected to that. I don't suppose many people in the room here would object to that. And so all we're saying with this bribe here, as you call it, you could also call it incentivize. So should government incentivize people to be healthy? Well, it does all the time. And I don't think anybody really thinks that's a bad thing. Yes, in the middle. I'm Simon Powell from Weight Wins, the company that ran the trial in Kent. (laughs) So you'll probably guess what I'm going to say next. Well, remind me how you voted. (laughs) I was for it. You were for it. It's actually already in practice as well, as well as the uh, the negative approaches like the uh, cigarettes. And uh, in Denmark, for example, the fat tax that's being tested now, where uh, products that are considered bad for you have taxes levied on them, is one side of the coin. The so other the side is incentive. Tax, just so I understand, the fat tax in Denmark, that's a tax on, on food that make... Food, not people, yes. Uh, so, so you see no problem with giving incentives for good behavior. How... Simon, how would you answer Mona's objection that this involves the state deciding what's good for us and trying to shape our behavior in that direction? What do you say to that argument? It's a personal choice to sign up to this sort of incentive. If you choose to take part in such a scheme, in fact, I took part in it myself, I am putting my own interests on the line, and so part of that is to act a certain way for an incentive. If that is seen as being suitable for the rest of uh, you know, the community, then I think that should also be allowed as well. And if you don't mind my asking, Sam, you said you yourself signed up for That's the scheme. Right. And can you tell us about that and whether it worked? Well, it worked for me, certainly. I lost uh, just over five stone and got £1,200 for it. Very good. And over how long a period of time? For two years. And you've, you've been able to maintain it? That's right. Now, you may be a very happy and welcome exception to what the studies show about long-term effects. You've probably seen the studies. Most of the studies show that most such schemes work in the short term, but after 12 to 18 months there is no statistically significant effect in terms of maintaining the loss. So you would be an exception to that. If those studies are right, how would you explain the difficulty of maintaining the loss, the weight loss, once the payment stops? Do you think there's a risk that the monetary incentive can become a kind of crutch so that when the money stops, the pounds return. 
of course that's going to be an issue. I think one question we need to look at in that regard is how many of these people would have ever lost the weight if it wasn't for any sort of incentive. Yes, some percentage of people do put weight back on, but there's some who achieved their target weight and stayed there. All right, I want to hear if there are any other objections, principled objections, to paying people to lose weight. Yes. Hi, um, my name's Rosa O'Shaughnessy. I'm an NHS doctor. And um, I think the fundamental principle here is to do with human dignity. And I think it is a fundamental tenet of being a doctor is to respect patient dignity. And bribing with money doesn't, in my opinion. And the very word bribe has negative connotations because in some level, on some level it goes against the patient's usual attitude and will. And I think it's patient dignity that I object to on this. Patient dignity? Yeah. Put aside the government and the NHS for the moment. Imagine you as a doctor with your patient. Yeah. And play out for us a little bit. Describe what it would be like if you were to be put in the position of saying to your patient, you're overweight, it's not good for you, you've tried to lose weight, but alas, you've failed. I'm going to uh, offer you money to try to do better. Can you, can you imagine yourself saying no, that? No, it's, it's unimaginable. I, I might try and invite all kinds of other incentives, but not that. That seems to me to be overriding their sense of human dignity on some level. Why, how does it violate their dignity? It's appealing to, instead of feelings of self-respect and so on, those, those are the reasons you would hope that they would want to lose weight. Yes. Um, self-preservation, self-respect and so on. To appeal instead to a monetary desire. It's just not right. I just it's not right. Tell me your name again. I didn't uh, know. Rosalind O'Shaughnessy. Okay, Dr. O'Shaughnessy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. What I hear in your worry about respecting the dignity of the patient. Somehow this would be undermined, you think, if you offered money rather than other kinds of reasons, reasons having to do with the well-being of that person yeah. rather than a financial yeah. inducement. Is that, Dr. O'Shaughnessy, because you think part of health includes not only those statistics and physical characteristics, but also developing the right kind of attitude toward our own health and our well-being in our bodies. Yes, I think that's correct. And the money would be better spent on preventative health, not, not directly to the individual. And so what might that be? That Su- might be... Subsidizing the price of broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would at least allow some patient choice. More cho- that would be more dignified for the patient, wouldn't it? More dignified. Yeah, it would. So you could give an incentive for people to eat broccoli through a subsidy, but that would be different from paying them to lose pounds. Yeah, it is different. It is, it's, it's qualitatively completely different. To stand in front of a patient and say, here, I'll give you 20 quid if you lose 20 pounds over the next 20 weeks, that is undignified, that interaction. That is very different to reducing the price of broccoli in the supermarket so that they might decide to buy some broccoli that day. All right, keep the microphone, and we'll hear a reply from Simon, who had a very good experience with him, who now... Do you run the company, Simon? Yes, that's right. All right, I wonder if the two of you would mind just standing up so you can address one another. (laughs) What do you say to Dr. O'Shaughnessy? I see why you're saying that uh, it takes away a dignity, but it is a personal choice that they themselves are making. If you force it upon them, you're right. But if it's an option that they can choose to take, there are monthly targets where people can choose how much they want to lose, at what speed, and all that's happening is that they are achieving small victories every month. If that's the case, if that's the way the model could work, would that not therefore be giving people the self-respect they no longer have for themselves? No, because I think it starts in the wrong place. I I think the, the word bribe encapsulates it rather well. There's something wrong with a bribe, isn't there? But an incentive would be better? More innocent incentives, yes. If we're looking at incentives, and broccoli was the the advantage used, obviously broccoli being cheaper than a chocolate bar would be a good idea. But if I look at a chocolate bar and think, it's 60p, what is that to me? 
if I look at a chocolate bar today and go, if I eat that chocolate bar, it costs me 60 pounds, there's another little bit in my brain. Everything's pointing in the right direction to help me make the choices I want to make. Yes, but that's outside. That's, you know, on the shelf in the shop. That's very different to a doctor standing opposite you saying, I will give you this money if you do this. I think they're, they're very different things. Does and I do, to... I do feel as a physician that to, to do mm. that is, it isn't respectful enough of the patient. If the NHS was to offer this, rather than it being specifically through NHS Choices or one of the other schemes, yeah. rather than specifically through your own doctor, yeah. does that give it enough impartiality? No, I don't like it. I, I, just right. think, I really think it's okay. fundamentally right. wrong. Thank you. I think, thank you both <laughs> for this exchange. One of, the, one of the very interesting issues is the clash between considerations of cost-effectiveness and the results that, at least for some maybe small number of people, can be achieved. And that's, broadly speaking, a utilitarian argument, saving the NHS money over the long term. Simon's argument depends on the utilitarian idea that we want to maximize the resources available to the NHS and reduce an unnecessary drain on those resources. And opposed to that utilitarian argument, which emphasizes cost, is a worry from Dr. O'Shaughnessy about what it means to respect the patient and to encourage in the patient the right kinds of attitudes toward health and well-being. And the worry that the financial incentive which might be justified on utilitarian terms, clashes with an important value to do with respect and dignity. And a second interesting feature of this exchange, the use of the word bribe, is there a difference between a bribe and an incentive? Are they interchangeable terms? It's certainly true, as has been pointed out, that to speak of a bribe is pejorative, whereas an incentive seems value-neutral. It's just a tool, a device, to get a certain kind of behavior. What is the difference, or is there a difference, between a bribe and an incentive? I think that they're the same thing, pretty much, and calling it an incentive is almost sort of being in denial about what you're actually doing, which is bribing. Um, And I also have a problem with the whole paying people to lose weight thing because I think it's very much along the lines of paying your child to do their homework or be polite. And why should someone who's overweight be paid to not pick a chocolate bar when there are other people out there who don't pick it but don't get paid for it? And tell us your name. Robin. Robin. So you think there is no real difference between a bribe and an incentive. But are incentives always bribes? Suppose I'm shopping for a car, and I find a dealership that is offering a a rebate or a discount, a financial incentive to buy the car. And that makes it more attractive to me. I'm more likely to buy that car rather than the one of the competing dealer. Is that incentive a bribe? Are they bribing me to buy their car? No, because you end up paying for it anyway. Right, I pay some price or other. But in the case of health? Well, you're not paying for anything. They're not making it cheaper for you. They're actually paying you to do something. And if the price of broccoli is subsidized so that more people will choose broccoli over chocolate for dessert, who would want broccoli for dessert? (laughs) Is that a bribe or is that an incentive? That is closer to the car dealership business than paying people to lose weight. You would say more like an incentive than a bribe. Well, I would be contradicting myself then because, <laughs> <laughs> because I just said that they're the same thing. So what do you conclude from that? My purpose is not to trick you. It's, <laughs> it's to try to get at what you really think. Who else? 
My name is Julian, and I'm a Harvard alum. I'm just working in London. I'm actually an alum of your justice class. Um, <laughs> and basically, I think the difference is that a bribe usually involves incentivizing somebody to go against their moral code or their responsibility. Like if you bribe a guard in a bank to help you with a bank robbery, he is then going against his other responsibilities. Or if you bribe a judge to look the other way when someone's a criminal and to let them off, he's violating his moral responsibility. Whereas an incentive, I think, is more of a positive nudge. You still make a choice. You're not violating any of your own moral precepts, whereas a bribe has that sort of inherent contradiction in it. So, and, wh- why, Julian, why wouldn't you say that if I give a, a bribe, a payoff to a judge in an act of corruption, why couldn't I say bribe? I'm just giving the judge an incentive to rule the right way. <laughs> Because you're still convincing him to cross a moral boundary where you know, he's made a commitment to uphold the law as opposed to saying, well, if I can incentivize you to buy broccoli by making broccoli cheaper, I'm not, violate, I'm not causing you to violate any moral precept that All you've right, already so signed a bribe, up to. A bribe, Julian suggests, involves violating a moral precept, whereas an incentive doesn't necessarily. I would and say that. So, and so is it correct to speak of health bribes? Or, are the, or is the language of bribery here just a piece of polemics? Actually, I disagree that we should bribe people to be healthy because I, think it's, I don't think it's appropriate to, reward, to effectively reward previous bad behavior. Ah. And so, this is a different argument from... Yeah, because effectively what, what you... When, I mean, I've seen some schemes in the U.S., for instance, where private health care providers will lower your premiums if you um, do sort of healthy things. So therefore, you're not rewarding bad behavior, you're actually rewarding good behavior by reducing their cost. And I would be more in favor of that than, in, than of paying people who have behaved badly. It's rewarding bad behavior. I think that was Soraya who got us going on this. Soraya, you agree it's, it's rewarding bad behavior? Completely. You make a choice whether you put toxic substances into your body. You make a choice how much you eat, what you eat. All the information is out there. It's just up to you whether you decide to read it you know, and follow it. It's completely a choice. I think essentially they're actually very similar, a bribe and incentive, because they're providing monetary motives to do something. Right. I think the distinction might be that a bribe is more overt than an incentive. And I actually think in that sense it actually has more moral integrity because the person who's doing it... <laughs> actually makes a conscious choice. If you come to the idea of subsidising broccoli, it's like you're skewing someone's autonomy on a really sneaky, subtle level because they're unable to pick it up. Whereas if you say to someone, if you want to, you can opt into into a system where you can lose weight with some monetary incentives, then that's actually a kind of a more overt conscious decision. So it both respects their dignity as an individual and has more moral integrity because it changes your autonomy in an overt way, which you're conscious of. Good, and tell us your name. Uh, my name's Kenan. Let's test the different distinctions people have offered between bribes and incentives by looking at another case. It's a case of a, a charity, a, a group not connected with any government, and a non-for-profit group. trying to. It's called Project Prevention, and what it tries to prevent are babies being born to drug-addicted women. It's a group that began in the U.S. and recently moved to the U.K., and it offers 200 pounds to drug-addicted women willing to undergo sterilization or long-term birth control. And many have accepted the offer. Let's take a a poll of the cash for sterilization scheme (laughs) and see what people think about it. How many are in favor? Raise your hands. I see about a dozen hands. How many are against? The vast majority think it's wrong. About a dozen defend it. So I need to hear from one of the brave dozen. Yes? It's completely up to them, to those women. And you're not spending public money on something where, obviously, if you look at the public, a lot of people would be against. The women, you say, have a freedom of choice whether to accept the money. It's completely up to them. Who disagrees with Sophie? I would disagree because 
First, you don't know maybe these women are in a very delicate like position and maybe they may be you know, influenced by the money or by other factors. So I think there is a choice, but like the money makes it biased in a way. And you know, maybe they want to buy drugs since it's a program for a drug-addicted women. So I would say right. like it's not a total choice, if you'd like. It's not a totally free choice, would you say? Yes. The money is like bringing an element of bias into it. An element of bias. Well, what's interesting about this objection, though, is it is nominally a choice, but some people say it's not a, a truly free choice. Why not? Um, I think it's partly about the position that the person is in before they make that choice. So if somebody is an injecting drug user, they're not necessarily in the same place, in the same context, to make a well-informed choice where they know all their options and where they're not coerced into something that they wouldn't otherwise do. So coercion. You think that money, uh, a financial offer, can be coercive? It can be coercive, yeah. So we have a question here. The question of incentives and bribes hangs a lot, many people think, on whether a financial incentive is really, really offers up a free choice. It's like that famous line from The Godfather. Do you remember? I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. <laughs> now, that offer, was that a, would you call that an incentive? <laughs> Does anyone have an objection beyond the question of free choice and coercion to the cash for sterilization scheme? Yes. Thank you. My name is Gian Marco. I'm an economist. Um, paying someone to do something is not probably the best way of inducing someone to do something. A bribe, I think, is a financial incentive that leads you to do something that is against your morality. Uh -huh. If you pay someone to do something, you're substituting some type of incentive, which can be a moral incentive or social incentive, with a monetary incentive. There was a study, I remember, basically they had a problem in a school because the parents were coming late to pick up their right, children. Right, the daycare study. Just to quickly uh, summarize the story, it involves incentives. It involved a daycare center where parents came late to pick up their children. Teachers had to stay late looking after them until the parents arrived. So with the help of some economists, the daycare center introduced a fine for late arriving parents. And the result, what do you suppose the result was? <laughs> More people came late to pick up their children. Now, this seems to run counter to the standard economic theory of the price effect. If you charge more for something, you will get less of it. In this case, you put a charge on the late arrival, you got more of it, and the suggestion is that the monetary incentive was crowding out other kinds of norms the norm of consideration for the teachers, let's say. In a way, that argument is akin to Dr. O'Shaughnessy's point about crowding out the right attitudes toward health and one's own well-being by bringing money into the picture. Do you, do you see, Dr. O'Shaughnessy, a, a, a parallel between the daycare story and what you worry about in the case of health? Yes. So now we have two different kinds of objections to the use of monetary incentives, at least in some cases, to try to get people to behave in a certain way. There are objections that say, is it really free choice or is it coerced? Are the drug-addicted women effectively coerced because they desperately want the money, maybe for more drugs? And the other objection, the one that points to other rival moral goods and moral values, such as the dignity of the patient, worries that sometimes monetary incentives can crowd out or erode non-monetary incentives, non-market norms that we should prize and respect and care about. Now, we've talked about financial incentives, paying people to do what's good for them and what also will save money for the community as a whole, We've talked, in effect, about carrots. What about sticks? What about disincentives? The other day, I saw on the newsstand, and I brought it along, a headline in the Daily Mail. <laughs> it says, Too fat for NHS surgery. Patients refuse treatment unless they change their lifestyle. 
and it told of some NHS trusts that will not give certain surgeries, hip and knee replacements, for example, to patients who are seriously overweight. They say, you can't have the operation unless you lose some weight and come back. How many find that objectionable? Should the NHS refuse surgery to people who are very overweight for knee or hip replacements? How many say, yes? And how many say, no, that's wrong, they shouldn't? For the audience at home, I report that there is a Rough division, equal division of the house with a lot of people not voting this time. (laughs) Who would like to address this question? In the back. I think the premise of the NHS is that it should be providing universal health care. And if you want to do that as a society, then to provide that and then use that provision as a way to coerce and uh, and force people either through bribes or sticks, to make different lifestyle decisions is an overreach of its power. It's, it's using an overreach. It to, it's using it to change lifestyle decisions, which it shouldn't be doing. It should just be there to provide the universal health care. I think the other important element to that is to recognise that people aren't necessarily coming to these decisions or choices on the same footing. I don't think many people wake up in the morning and think, I'm going to keep up my alcoholism, or I'm, you know, I enjoy being unable to walk to the bus stop without getting out of breath. I think the NHS needs to recognise, or part of the NHS's value is to recognise that not everyone has the same access to decisions in terms of being healthy. You know, it's correlated to class, income, your upbringing, your experiences as a child. It's not as simple as, oh, they made the wrong decision because they thought it'd be a laugh to be drunk all day. And tell us your name. Alice. Alice. And so what do you say about liver transplants to people who suffer from alcoholism? Well, I, I would say they're equally, equally justified. You know, an alcoholic, we, we don't know what's made that person be an alcoholic. We're not in the position to judge that. The medical profession's job is to, is to look after people. We don't know what life they may subsequently go on to lead. You know, the person who's an alcoholic, it may be the turning point in their life. They may go on to change the world. And it's not for the NHS or for medical practitioners to make those judgments. Hi, my name's Pete. I think you're free to behave how you wish, but you're not free from accountability. And I think that's chief of the problem. If you're in a situation with private health care, you're able to pay for the consequences of your actions, then you have every right to behave as you wish, as long as it doesn't infringe on other people's rights to do as they please. But having to rely upon society to save you from the mistakes you've made denies you, and if you come back to a point of dignity, accountability for your actions, which I think is important if you want to be a citizen, if you want to have personal dignity. And so that means you vote how on the transplant for the alcoholic? As I understand the the liver transplant system, if they haven't had a drink in a certain period of time, that makes them eligible for the liver transplant. If they have gone back to drinking recently, then they get dropped off the list. If someone has made a serious change to their life and has kept off drink for a long time, then they absolutely should keep their place on the list. But if you have someone who has uh, started drinking recently just before liver transplant, then they should be taken off the list. And what about someone seriously overweight who needs a hip or a knee transplant? Should they get it? The hip and the knee transplant seems to have less of an issue of scarcity of resources. We know how difficult it is to find liver transplants. Ultimately, I think that it is not unreasonable to place an expectation on the patient that they lose X amount of weight in order to be eligible for the operation. So we've just heard now a debate about paternalism, really. What counts as overreaching by the state in imposing judgments, moral judgments sometimes, about the best way to live. Some people say it's not the job of the government or the NHS to pass judgment on what's a good life or a bad life, even a healthy life or an unhealthy life. That's for each individual to choose for himself or herself. And it's overreaching, it's discrimination to deny a liver transplant, say, to an alcoholic. Other people say no. If public resources are involved, there needs to be accountability to the public, to the community as a whole. And so it's legitimate for the government or the NHS to try to encourage certain kind of behavior, whether through the use of carrots or whether through the use of sticks. In exploring the difference between bribes and incentives, 
we came up with a couple of possible distinctions. One of them had to do with the suggestion that a bribe involves a payment to do something that's morally dodgy or against your convictions, whereas an incentive is morally neutral. And we've considered some examples of how the use of financial incentives, the introduction of money, can crowd out other values, other norms, as in the late arriving parents at the daycare center. And the worry is, in going back to our case of bribing people or paying people to lose weight, the worry is that the money may drive out attitudes and norms about the proper regard for one's own body. Robin, when she was making an argument, mentioned paying children to be polite. That reminds me, Robin, of a friend of mine who, believe it or not, pays his young children one dollar for each thank you note they write. (laughs) Every time they get a gift or are taken out to dinner or something like that. In fact, I've received a few of these thank you notes. (laughs) And reading them, I can tell that they were written under duress. (laughs) Which brings us back to the question of whether money is sometimes coercive or whether it's an offer, an offer that can be freely accepted or rejected. But the example of the thank you notes brings out even a more fundamental feature of the discussion we've had about paying people to be healthy, which is there is always a question when we introduce money to try to shape people's behavior. The question in the case of the thank you notes it's something I wonder about, is what lesson my friend's children are learning. It's one thing to say it's an efficient system, this system of incentives, to produce more thank you notes than would otherwise be forthcoming. That's the economic efficiency argument. And you might say it's even the utilitarian argument on the assumption that the recipients actually like to receive those thank you notes. But there's another question. What lesson does it teach about thank you notes? Now, it could turn out either way. It might turn out that if children write enough thank you notes when they're young, even if they're bribed to do so, they will get in the habit of writing thank you notes and carry on doing it even when they grow up and no one is paying them a dollar to do so. That might happen. Or... It could also turn out that being paid to express gratitude crowds out learning the virtue of gratitude. So it might happen that these children, when they grow up, will come to think of thank you notes as piecework, the kind of thing to be done for pay, and maybe when the money stops, so will the thank you notes, and maybe the money will have crowded out learning gratitude. It's hard to know in advance. It's not a question that philosophy can answer, how it will turn out with the thank you notes, or how it will turn out with paying people to lose weight. The philosophical questions, though, are two. First, is the use of financial incentives or bribes to promote health consistent with freedom, true freedom of choice, or is it implicitly coercive? The other issue is, what do we want to teach? As with the thank you notes, so with the payments for good health. Does the money possibly achieve a good short-term result at the expense of crowding out norms, crowding out values of respect for the dignity of the patient, the dignity of the person, can it be that financial incentives are different from bribes 
only in those cases where the effect of money is to dampen or erode or crowd out other values that should properly govern the situation, whether it's health or thank you notes. And so, thank you for joining us in this discussion of public philosophy. We began with the question of whether we should bribe people to be healthy. We questioned what does it mean to bribe people at all. And in sorting this question out, we were led, just as we suspected, at least I suspected at the beginning, that in order to address very concrete, very practical, and often controversial questions of public life, we find ourselves inescapably committing philosophy. Thank you very much. Thank you for downloading Michael Sandel, The Public Philosopher. If you enjoyed this program, you can hear more from Michael Sandel by downloading his 2009 BBC Reef Lectures via the Reef Lectures archive. To find out more and for our full terms and conditions, visit the Radio 4 website.